All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started uh, with uh, tonight's webinar. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody tuning in this evening. Looks like we got a good crowd of folks here. Um, I am Adam Sones. I am with the Tennessee Adult Education Division. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instruction here with the division. Uh, prior to being here with the state office, I was the um, uh, di uh, district coordinator for District 5 at the time, which is Workforce Essentials. Um, and prior to that, I've been in the classroom and in a lead instructor role and in a part-time instructor role. And I've done a lot of the paraprofessional work as well, doing a lot of data entry back with uh, CMATS. If some of you remember CMATS, I'm sure we all do. Um, so I, I know I've, I've done quite a lot of different things in adult education, and, and I'm excited to be here in this role now. Um, but I've got uh, some good stuff, hopefully, for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking all about the TABE. 11 and 12, and I really want to do some uh, deep dive into the content of this uh, of these tests to give you uh, a good understanding of you know exactly what the students are going to experience and exactly what they need to know uh, in order to succeed on this uh, on this test and get measurable skill gains and so on and so forth. Um, but just briefly, prior to us really diving into this, um, I just want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping issues and some uh, just some ground rules for the webinar. Um, first, a couple of frequently asked questions. Um, a lot of folks ask on webinars whether or not the webinar will be recorded. Um, the answer to that is yes, uh, it will be recorded. Um, I will record, uh, we're doing four of these webinars. I've recorded uh, the first few and this one as well, and I will post whichever one I don't mess up on the most. Uh, somewhere for everybody to view. So we'll keep that and make sure that that's recorded just in case you need to come back and reference this again or if you need to share this with any of your colleagues or anybody else that is just desperately wanting to know about the TABE 11 and 12. Um, I will also be sending out a copy of the presentation as well for everybody to view um, so you'll have access to any of the materials or anything like that that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, let's see, next, uh, if you have any questions during this time at all, Again, I've got everybody's microphones muted, and I will be going through just kind of throughout this whole webinar. And if anybody's mic comes unmuted for any reason, I will go back and re-mute that. And again, please don't take offense to that. That's just me making sure that we don't have any feedback or any audio issues uh, during the webinar. But if you do have any questions, feel free to type those into the chat box um, as you are um, as as they occur to you or at the end of the, the webinar as well. And I'll be going through and we'll save about 20 or 30 minutes just to answer any questions that you all might have. Um, I'll do my best to answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, if you uh, need to get credit or if you need uh, a certificate of attendance for this webinar, I will be sharing with you a, a Google form at the end of the presentation in the chat box. Uh, I'll send a link over to everybody uh, you'll be able to fill out um, uh, just some quick information and get a certification of attendance for the webinar, which you can use uh, if you need that to show your supervisor for any reason or if um, you need uh, you know, professional development points for teacher licensure or anything like that. So I'll be sharing that with everybody at the end here in the chat box, and uh, I'll share my contact information, which is also right here on your screen. Um, if you, you know, for some reason didn't get that, um, that form, you can email me or anybody really at the state office and we can help you out. Um, also, at any point in time throughout this webinar, if you can't hear me uh, or if you can't see my screen or something's wrong, uh, feel free to just type that into the chat box and I'll try to keep an eye on that. And if I notice that everybody can't hear me, uh, then we will troubleshoot and figure out where to go from there. Um, okay, so again, I appreciate everybody joining you, uh, or joining me, rather, uh, and it's good to be here with you tonight. Um, we'll go ahead and get, grow, get going with all the Table 11 and 12 stuff. Um, I, my plan really here is to talk all about the Table 11 and 12. Um, I really want to dive into uh, a really important question, which is why we are doing this. Why are we using this test? Why aren't we just continuing to use the CASAS test? Um, I want to give you a broad overview of the design of the test, um, hopefully dive into a little bit of what the test makers were thinking whenever they, they created the test, or at least my analysis of what they were thinking whenever they created the test. Um, I want to give you a breakdown of the content and the format of the test, so not just the what, but also the how are the questions being asked. Um, I want to show you some of the skills and competencies and standards and all of that 
um, that are going to be on uh, each of these tests as well, as well as what that looks like in context. So we'll actually look at some of the sample items and things like that from the table 11 and 12 and talk about how uh, what you know what the students are going to see when they take each different level of test and all of that. Um, I also want to show you some places where you can explore all of this stuff on your own. Because as you'll see, um, whenever we get into this, there's a lot going on with the table 11 and 12. Um, there's just a lot happening and not enough time to really cover that uh, in an hour or hour and a half webinar. So I want to show you uh, some different resources where you can go and actually explore some of this stuff on your own and broaden your own understanding of uh, what's on these tests. Um, we've created some, some really good resources for that, and, I, and I'm, I'm excited to show you that here at the end. Um, I, I also just want to make sure that I answer any questions that anybody has um, about the Tab 11 and 12. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. I will be going through and answering all of that stuff at the end. Um, and I'll, I want to make sure that I, that I cover everything that you guys might have, any, any questions that you guys might have. So let's, let's get started with kind of the first, first thing here, which is, which is why are we doing this? Um, I think that it's a, it's a, I don't know, a pillar of adult education that adults need to know why we are doing something. Why am I doing this? Um, that's a very important thing. And so I want to make sure uh, I answer that. And uh, like any good teacher might, I'm going to start out with uh, an analogy to kind of explain this. Um, so on your screen, uh, you should see a uh, measuring device. This is called a caliper. A caliper is used to measure very small things normally. Uh, whenever, I whenever I worked um, in, a, in a factory making drumsticks and marimba mallets and xylophone mallets and stuff like that, I used a caliper to measure the width of the dowels that we used. This is called the surveyor's wheel. A surveyor's wheel uh, is something to use to measure long distances typically and typically like on the ground. Uh, I had somebody come out and look at putting concrete, uh, putting new concrete in my driveway and they used a surveyor's wheel to measure out how much concrete that they might need to pour. This is obviously a measuring tape. Uh, a measuring tape is something that you would use to measure straight distances, right? Uh, if you were going to measure the size of, say, a room uh, to figure out how much paint you were going to put in the room, uh, you would use a measuring tape to measure out the walls. And then lastly, this is a big fish. Fish swim in the ocean and the lakes, and you probably know what a fish is already, so I don't need to really dive into that any further. So uh, first pop quiz of the night is this. If I was going to measure this fish, which measuring device might I use? Well, obviously not the caliper and hopefully not the surveyor's wheel. Um, indeed, we would use the measuring tape. Uh, and in this case, the analogy obviously here is that the tape 11 and 12 is the measuring tape and the fish are our adult basic education students. And yes, this is a little bit of a ridiculous analogy, but uh, I think it's a really important distinction to make. Um, we are not deciding what to measure based on the measuring device that we have in hand. Uh, so we're not saying, we have a measuring tape, what should we go measure? But instead, we're deciding which measuring device to use based on what it is that we need to measure. In this case, students and student progress and growth. Um, so we decided to move to the tape 11 and 12 because it's the best measuring device that is out there for our adult basic education students. Uh, in essence, we're, we're starting with the student first and then going from there. And that's kind of the whole, uh, that's, I think, how we're going to make all decisions, uh, you know, here at the state office. But uh, again, with the tape 11 and 12, we are not deciding, okay, which, dev which measuring device is out there now, what should we measure with it? We're starting with the students first and then deciding what the best tool is to measure their growth. Uh, it would be very similar to if there was, say, an ant, and we also needed to measure the size of that ant, and we said, okay, let's use a caliper to measure the size of that ant, because it gives us very uh, fine measurements all the way down to fractional and, uh, you know, long decimals and things like that. So in this case, maybe the ant is the uh, IELCE student, and the caliper is uh, the CASAS test. Uh, it's probably the best measuring device for that ant. 
So again, I think that's a really important distinction to make. Um, I know it's kind of a silly analogy, but uh, again, I think adults um, and everybody just kind of needs to know why. Why are we doing this? What's, what's the point? Um, and that's, that's kind of the point there. So I'll move away from that and talk about something that's probably a little bit more uh, relevant to your, your everyday jobs, uh, which is the NRS. Uh, we hear we use that acronym a lot, NRS, to talk about NRS levels, level one, level two, level three. Um, the NRS stands for the National Reporting System, National Reporting System, uh, which is through the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education, uh, OCTE, as we call them. Uh, which is basically the federal office of adult education uh, who all the state offices report to. So the national reporting system though is defined as this. It says the national reporting system for adult education is an outcome-based accountability system for the state administered federally funded adult education program developed by the US Department of Education's Division of Adult Education and Literacy the NRS continues a cooperative process through which state adult education directors and DAEL manage a reporting system that demonstrates learner outcomes for adult education. An NRS technical working group provides guidance to DAEL on NRS policy and projects designed uh, and projects designed to improve the use of NRS data. So basically this is a bunch of federal language, but and the gist of this is that it says that the NRS is the process through which states demonstrate learner outcomes. So that's why when we say NRS levels or, or anything like that, that's, this is what we're really talking about. Uh, we are talking about this is how we report to the federal government what our outcomes are for adult education. And then they look at that and say, oh, you did great. Here's some more money to do that again next year. So the NRS is really the system, the national reporting system that we use to just measure uh, to demonstrate our, our outcomes uh, in our programs. And, and again, I think that's really important for, for all of us to know. That's why we do what we have to do. So the NRS uh, are the ones that actually decide which tests we are allowed to use uh, to demonstrate those outcomes. And they, you know, they put together a list of different tests, um, like the TABE and the CASAS, and say that these are kind of approved and Recently, in uh, I think this was in February of this past year, um, they said that the TAB 11 and 12 was approved for use uh, beyond 2019. The TAB 11 and uh, 12 math also approved for use uh, to demonstrate learner outcomes. The CASAS reading test, uh, their new reading test, not the one that we're currently using, but the new one that they've developed is also approved. Uh, but the CASAS math test that they developed uh, is not approved. Um, and so, again, that's, it's not that the TABE 11 and 12 is, is just the best test in order to use uh, to measure our students, but it's also, at this point, really the only test that we can use to measure our students' uh, progress and our student growth. Um, so, again, we're, we're switching over to this TABE 11 and 12 for our adult basic education programs, for, for a couple of reasons. One, again, it's really just kind of the best way to measure growth. And two, we really kind of have to do that. Um, so again, that just kind of answers the question of why uh, we're moving in this direction, which I, I think is really important for everybody to know uh, first off. Oh, and by the way, there are, there are other assessments that the NRS has actually approved. It's not just the TABE and the CASAS. Um, there, there are a few others out there. Like, uh, if you've been around for, for a little while, you might remember the BEST or the BEST Plus or the GAIN test. Um, both of those, I think, are mostly for uh, uh, English language learners. Um, there's a few other tests out there. I think Massachusetts actually has its own test, the Massachusetts Aptitude Test for Adult Learners or something like that, um, that they use in, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, but all of those, all of those tests uh, are not really good for our use here in Tennessee. So they're, they're kind of questionable. We, we don't really want to dive into those um, just because they're not really very relevant for us here in Tennessee. So, okay, so let's, let's move on a little bit from just kind of that why question. And I, and I want to break down, get into like the breakdown of the content um, of the test. So as you know, um, as you probably know, the tape has three subjects, which are reading, language, and math. 
And if you remember the tape from uh, the tape nine and ten from back several years ago, um, that also had you know vocabulary and spelling and some other things like that. None of that's on there. They've really rolled that into just three subjects for the math or for the I'm sorry for the table eleven and twelve, which is reading, language, and math. These tests are broken out into five different levels, or the, the literacy, easy, medium, difficult, and advanced levels, or typically referred to as the L, E, M, D, and A for short. So first of all, um, we only purchased the level E, the M, and the D on paper because those tests are really the only ones that we're ever really going to use. You're not going to have a lot of students that test into that literacy level. Um, that is very much just for, uh, you know, new readers or uh, folks who, you know, might not speak English as a, as a first language. Um, the A level is is pretty advanced. It gets it gets up there into some very difficult stuff, like some uh, math that I have no idea what what to do with, and things like that. So most of our students are really going to be here in the in this middle, the easy, med medium, and difficult. Um, but trust me when when I say that that's actually very um, that's that's a very robust um, menu of tests right here. That really gives us a lot, um, all the way from like first, second, third grade kind of standards and levels all the way up through high school uh, level standards. So that, that's a very uh, broad spectrum right there. But uh, if, you, if the students take this test on the computer, which I think most will, um, then they have all five tests available right there. So first of all, one thing to just kind of note that's very important is uh, how long these tests take. The reading test uh, for everything but the le L level test takes about two hours uh, if the students take all of their time. The language test takes one hour, 60 minutes, and the math test takes 75 minutes, or an hour and 15 minutes, uh, which is a long time. Um, as a matter of fact, if you factor in the locator test, uh, which again takes up a little bit of time as well, it's quite possible if somebody was to sit down, take up all of the time uh, on every single one of these tests and take them all right there in a row, that they would uh, take up almost six hours. That's five hours and 55 minutes right here. Um, if somebody was going to take the entire locator and then take the entire um, slew of slew of tests right there, which again is, is a long time. That's almost uh, close to the high set. The high set takes seven hours and five minutes, I think, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that at this point. Um, but that's a long time. Uh, now, one, one thing to note here uh, that's that's important to, to talk about is most programs probably won't be using all three of these subtests, and nobody's required to use all three of these subtests or anything like that. Um, as a matter of fact, most programs will probably really only use the reading and the math test, and in other cases might you know use the language test just in case. Uh, some programs, it's even quite possible that students might come in and only ever take a reading test or only ever take a math test if that's what they need. Um, that's quite possible and in that case would obviously shorten the time here uh, significantly. But again, I just I think it's important to note that this stuff does take a long time, uh, which makes me think uh, that we should really probably rethink our intake process. I mean, I was actually earlier today, I was on a, a webinar, attending a webinar myself through COABE, which is the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, which is just kind of a, a national advocacy organization for adult education. Um, they had their virtual conference, and there was a gentleman from North Carolina talking about uh, the intake process and, and how um, we really need to be rethinking that just kind of nationally right now, especially with the tape coming up, because it's just a very long uh, test. So anyway... Uh, that's a whole nother conversation, uh, so I won't really dive into the orientation and intake process right now, but it's something that I think we should rethink and maybe even take, you know, some assessment out of that, um, and, and put it somewhere else. And so, anyway. Oh, this character, by the way, not actually based on me. Uh, I found him in Prezi, and he kind of looked like me, so I threw him in there. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to point that out. Okay. So that's how long each of these tests take. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about the like item types, the format of the test here. Because, um, well, here, we'll just dive into it. So uh, the reading test, it, it yes, it does take two hours, but this test is actually split up into two different parts, so part A and part B. 
uh, or part one and part two, rather. Both of those take an hour. Um, there are some questions on the reading test that are actually a part A and a part B question. So you might see uh, like question 3A and then question 3B. Uh, and then we would move on to question 4 or something like that. Some of the items, um, the multiple choice items, extend all the way to letter F. So you'll have options that are like A, B, C, D, E, and F, uh, which could, you know, throw some students off as well. And those actually require multiple responses, uh, which is a little confusing. So those would actually require students to maybe say the answer for question 3B is uh, option D and option E or something like that. And so that's something to note and maybe something that we students would definitely need to know prior to taking one of these tests uh, is that, you know, there might come a time where they're prompted to, to select two different responses. So again, that's just something that students probably need to know before taking that. The language test is only one test, uh, but there are also part A and part B questions. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to show you all of this here in context here in just a little bit, but I, I want to kind of go over some of this stuff first. Um, again, yeah, there are part A, part B questions, uh, and some of the responses extend all the way to letter I. I think it's only one question that gets all the way there, but um, I wanted to throw that out there. So, so this extends all the way to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, and that would require multiple responses, like sometimes two, three, uh, maybe even four responses in, in certain cases. Um, again, one thing that could really just throw students off, and, and perhaps it's something that we need to address with them uh, in the intake process right before they take, you know, an assessment. Hey, by the way, uh, you're going to have some questions that are going to prompt you to take, uh, to select multiple responses here. The math test, and bear with me because this is a little confusing, um, but I'm going to do my best to explain it. Again, feel free to ask me questions, and, and I'll get to that at the end. So the math test, again, we have the L, the E, the M, the D, and the A. The L and the E are only one math test, so it's only one test for the L and the E. The M, the D, and the A is actually split into two different parts, and there's a calculator allowed on part two of the M, the D, and the A. So the L and the E, the first two tests, again, that doesn't have any, it's only one part, and there's no calculator use on the whole test. But once you get into the M, the D, and the A, uh, you use a calculator on part two of that test. Uh, they say that the level M requires just a basic four-function calculator, that the level D and the level A, you can use a scientific calculator. Um, I actually clarified with the folks at TAVE yesterday that we could use a scientific calculator for level M as well. Um, it only just, you probably only need the four function calculator, but you can use a scientific calculator so long as that calculator is not programmable, like a graphing calculator or something where students could uh, plug in a formula and save it into the calculator or something like that. So again, L and the E, one test, no calculator, M, D, and A, two tests, scientific calculator on part two. The math test is also split. Some of the questions are also split into a part A and a part B. So again, you might see question 15A and then question 15B or something like that. Uh, some of the math test uh, questions extend all the way to letter G and would require multiple responses. So again, you know, maybe the answer for question 15B is option A, option D, and option F. Uh, that could be a, that could be something on one of these tests. And then lastly, on the math test, and this is this is a little new, but some of the questions are not multiple choice. So everything up until this point has been multiple choice. Some of the math questions are not multiple choice, and they actually require you to enter uh, the answer into kind of a grid system. And you, some of you might remember this from the old GED test, uh, the old OPTs, if you remember this at all. This kind of grid answer system where say if a student um, you know their answer was 1.25 1.25 was the answer they would put that into the boxes up top and then they would actually go and bubble in each of those things and that's how they would record their answer now there's only a handful of these questions and I think you know they're only on maybe like the level M and the level D but uh, again, something that students might need to know prior to taking this math test is that they might see a question like that. Um, 
typically the, the question requires, um, you know, a decimal point or a fraction or something like that, but students can put all of that in and they would bubble that in just, just accordingly. So that's kind of how the tests are, are really broken out in terms of the, the timing and then in terms of the format. Um, but I know you guys are here because you're really more curious about the content, so let's talk a little bit more about, about that and we'll dive into to all of this. Okay, so real quick though, before we, we talk about content, um, these, stand, these, these, these tests are, are based entirely in the CCR standards, and, and I want to take a minute and talk about standards. Um, I've been in the classroom. I, I know as an educator that standards uh, can be way too cumbersome to try to put into practice most of the time. Um, that it's just very difficult, especially if you're in the middle of a class and you have five students and they're all at different levels, and you're like, ah, I've got to figure out what to teach these five students and it doesn't really make sense to open up a you know a 200 page novel with a bunch of technical language in there i totally get that um that's not something that anybody should should be you know an expert at or anything like that but here's the good part of standards here's what i think the good thing that standards give us is um standards give us a basic universal language that we can use to speak to other parts of the educational universe so, for instance, um, it's, I think it's important for, for test makers, uh, curriculum designers, uh, instructional delivery people, i.e. teachers, uh, to really all speak the same language to each other. And then instructors can use that language to speak. You, you may not use that exact language to speak to students, but at least you can understand what's going on with assessments and with curriculum. And then it would be an instructor's job to really translate that in a way for students to understand and then learn those concepts. Uh, so to draw another analogy here, the standards are, are like the inner parts of a, uh, say, a car's engine. You don't need to know exactly what a spark plug is in order to drive somebody around in a car, but it is helpful when you go into a mechanic to be able to use uh, the right terminology. So that's, that's kind of my spiel about standards. Uh, I think um, they have use, they have benefit, um, everybody is kind of using the same language when we're talking about curriculum design and assessment design, and now we're talking about it with instructional design, but that doesn't mean that we need to really speak that language to students um, as well. And so, again, that's just kind of my spiel on that. Just wanted to talk really quick about that, but trust me that I understand the, the plight <laughs> of trying to implement standards-based instruction in, into your lessons every day. That, that's a little difficult. But with that in mind, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the standards that are on these tests. Um, so they break these tests into uh, domains. All of these standards have domains. The reading test, as you can see, has four different domains that are on there. Uh, reading foundational skills, key ideas and details, craft and structure, integration of knowledge and ideas. Uh, the language, you can see there's four there as well, which are conventions of standard English, knowledge of language, vocabulary acquisition and use, text type and purposes. And then with math, there's a whole slew of things right there uh, that hopefully look pretty familiar to, to all of you, which are you know measurement and data. Uh, if you keep going down, you'll see things like geometry or ratios and proportional relationships. Um, everybody's favorite a little bit further down is functions. Uh, we have algebra, things like that, um, things that are very, um, you know, that are common across math. Um, this doesn't really tell you a lot, though. This doesn't really give a very clear picture of what's on the test. And so one really good tool that the uh, creators of the TABE make are what these things that, that they call blueprints. So the blueprints actually show you each level uh, in each subject of the TABE and not just what domain is on there, i.e., you know, reading foundational skills, but which exact standards are on each of those tests. Um, and so I want to dive in and kind of show you what this looks like, and then we'll, we'll talk about what that actually looks like in context. So he here's one of the blueprints right here, and this is for the level E reading test. So this is the table 11 and 12 reading test. Uh, as you can see, here's all those domains. We have phonics and word recognition, all of those things, key ideas and details, so on and so forth. Uh, those are the, the four domains, as well as what percentage uh, of each of these domains are actually on the tests. 
So that's good to know. Uh, we can see that the majority of the test here for the level E reading is key ideas and details. And then this also offers us a list of the actual standards that make up those domains. And so this is where you can really dive in and see, you know, what it is that they mean when they say integration of knowledge and ideas. So like, for instance, the first standard here is 3.ri.7, uh, which stands for third grade reading for information standard number seven, which this is FYI, this is common core coding. And uh, they, so that's kind of how they code that is, you know, the first number is going to be the grade level. The second thing going on is going to be um, the strand is what they call that. So this is reading for information. Uh, and then the standard number. So you might see seven or seven B. It's really just some technical coding, just so kind of everybody speaks the same language there. Um, and just, again, another FYI is that the college and career readiness standards are based entirely on the Common Core standards. So I didn't know if everybody knows that, but that, that is the case. They just kind of whittled down the Common Core standards to a, a little bit smaller of a list. So anyway, this standard says use information gained from illustration, for example, maps and photographs, and the words in a text to demonstrate understanding of the text. For example, when uh, or where, when, why, and how key events occur. So that's one of the things that they mean when they say integration of knowledge and ideas. So uh, these blueprints offer us a list of, of all of this stuff. And, and I, let's, let's zoom into one thing here. Let's look at this under key ideas and details. And we'll look at standard 3.ri.2, which again is third grade reading for information, standard number two. Uh, this says determine the main idea of a text and recount the key details and explain how they support the main idea. And so let me show you what this looks like in context. Uh, so this is uh, a practice test. This is actually on the TABES website. And whenever students uh, take the paper-based test, this is the very first thing that they'll see. It's a practice test, just so they kind of get used to the structure and everything. So this is the level E. So this is the easy uh, reading test. So you, we can see question number one here says, which word has a short E vowel sound? So that's where we get into our phonics and word recognition and things like that. And then under this, we have uh, a, a rather lengthy um, article here with three paragraphs. Um, and then under that, there's a pie chart, which is interesting. And then that continues. And there are four more paragraphs, again, rather lengthy. Uh, and then a question, question number two, that says, according to the article, which of these explains what will happen if people do not save water? So again, we're already seeing this is there. We're looking for evidence here. We're looking for key ideas and details and evidence uh, by, by saying according to the article. That's that's kind of what we're looking at here. So question three is where we're going to get into these kind of two parter questions right here. Uh, and if you remember, here's the standard that we were going to look at, 3.ri.2. It says, determine the main idea of a text, and then recount the key details and explain how they support the main idea. So question three, part A, it's very obvious. What is the main idea of the article? And I know we didn't go through and read that article, but here was the answer. The answer was C. It says that there are many ways to save water. It's an important natural resource. So that that's the main idea of the article. And then we see part B. B, which says which two sentences support the answer to part B. So this is one of those two parters. So two part question. And then the second part is saying, you know, which two sentences. So basically, what's your evidence? Why are you saying uh, that C is the main idea? And so these two option D and option E are the answers here. Um, and that is that is what the second part of that standard is, which is recount the key details and explain how they support the main idea. So again, I just wanted to kind of point that out. That's that's something that students are going to need to know going into taking these tests is that they might be prompted to ask or to, to select two different responses here, uh, where they're going to have to support, you know, their their first response, so part A of the question. And one other thing to kind of note here um, is that if the students uh, get part A correct, well, hang on, let's back up. So if the students get part B correct. So like, let's say that they said option D and option E for part B, but they got option A incorrect. They get the entire question wrong. Uh, it's because they needed to get the main idea first and then say what they're uh, what supported that. So if they got part A 
uh, incorrect, they get the whole question wrong. However, if they get part A correct, so they did say that the answer is C per, for part A, uh, but they get part B incorrect, then they get partial credit for this question. And I think the way that they score this is it's, I think it's basically they get half credit, 50%. Um, so that is just something to note as well. So then we see question number four down here, which says, look at the pie chart in the article. There's some math going on there, which again is, is interesting that this is on a reading test, but uh, hey, I think that's just kind of where the, the standards are, are telling us to go. So that's something interesting. So that, that's kind of what these standards look like in context. That's how, that's how these assessments are used to, to measure these standards and measure these skills. So I think that's important to look at. And so Let's look, at a, let's look at a math blueprint now. Uh, this is from the Table 11 and 12 Level D math test. So there's a lot going on here. Um, we see geometry, we see expressions and equations, ratios and proportional relationships, statistics and probability, the number system, functions, everybody's favorite thing. Functions is on there. Um, this is, and then we have the list of standards again under this. So Oh, and one thing that I noticed um, actually Monday uh, while I was delivering this is that uh, it says over here, I'm going to get my mouse, it says over here geometry is 15%, and then up here it says geometry is 18%, um, which is a discrepancy, but I did some quick math and uh, discovered that the 18% up in the pie chart is actually correct. So I guess the tape folks were rushing that a little bit, but that is something just to note right there. So anyway, again, this lists all of these standards here. Uh, it looks like we have some kind of 7th and 8th grade, or uh, if you're familiar with the correlations to the NRS, these are level 4 standards, some higher level 4 standards right here. Um, so those are all of our geometry standards. We have a lot of statistics and probability standards. We've got a lot of number system and functions standards, and more and more and more standards. So there's... There's a lot going on here. I get that. But again, let's dive into one of these standards, and, and, and I'll show you again kind of what this looks like in context on one of their assessments. So this is standard 8.sp.1, which is, again, 8th grade, statistics and probability, standard number 1. It says, construct and interpret scatter plots for bivariate measurement data to investigate patterns of association between two quantities. Describe patterns such as clustering, outliers, positive or negative association, linear association, and nonlinear association. So basically this is saying, can a student look at a scatter plot and figure out what's going on? So again, uh, this is one of the sample tests uh, from their website and also in the beginning of the test booklets that the students will see. Uh, this is from the level D uh, TAB math test. And so right away we see, you know, question number one is looks like a geometry question where we're talking about um, the Pythagorean theory with right triangles and trying to determine what the perimeter of the triangle is. And then we see question number two, which is uh, it's asking what is the probability that a female is elected president and a male is elected vice president in this situation. So we have a probability question, statistics and probability. Uh, question number three is looks like a uh, you know, rate of two feet per second and then miles per hour, so probably some kind of proportional relationship or ratio kind of question. Move on, we see question number four, uh, which we're starting to get into the coordinate grid right here. Um, we're looking for each unit representing a kilometer and then trying to determine the length of the route in kilometers right there. And then we have question number five which here's our scatter plot. And if you remember, here's the standard that we pulled out from the beginning, which again says construct and interpret scatter plots for bivariate measurement data, so on and so forth. And so the scatter plot, uh, what we're looking at is it says which type of pattern is displayed on the scatter plot. So it looks like uh, from it's going down from left to right, so it's, it's a negative kind of association. Uh, we don't see any real clustering of data points or anything like that. I think you could maybe argue that um, there's some clustering going on around the 8 and the 10 up at the top kind of there, but um, I would also say that there's probably not enough data to really uh, back that up. So we'll say no clustering on this, and then there's, there's pretty obviously no outliers on this as well. And so that's exactly what the answer is, which is C, which is it's a linear negative association with no outliers. 
So again, this is just saying what is going on in this scatter plot with bivariate measurement data. So again, we're just comparing two variables across a y and an x-axis. Um, and again, this is some very technical language. We we would probably never say to students that, hey, can you can you interpret that scatter plot with bivariate measurement data to investigate patterns of association for me? That they would probably look at you with a little bit of a, a quizzical look, right? But uh, that's is some some language that we can use to kind of talk to each other and talk to assessments and talk to curriculum and, and kind of understand what's going on between those different worlds. Um, but with students, we wouldn't really ever say these kinds of things. We might use vocabulary terms like clustering and outliers and association and nonlinear association and things like that, which are very important to teach. Uh, but we wouldn't necessarily always use this very technical language to, to teach. And I get that. Okay, so again, I, I'll show you some some things a little bit here later that you can use to actually explore these standards. Um, we've... Uh, We've actually created some pretty good stuff, and I realize that this is there's a lot going on here. As a matter of fact, on the uh, on just this level D test for both you know the table eleven and twelve, there's thirty seven unique standards, which is a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to take in, and I and I definitely understand that as a teacher. That's just a, this, a lot to try to teach. Um, so again, we've really created some things and to for you to be able to explore that on your own and just find some resources to kind of back up these standards. And I'll dive into that here in just a little bit as well. Um, hopefully by now, a few of you or hopefully all of you are, are familiar with the staff portal, the Tennessee Adult Education Staff Portal. Uh, this is a website that we created. Here's the URL. It's sites.google.com slash view slash AE staff. Um, this is a URL or a website rather that we created to that has just a ton of different resources on there. Uh, I'll dive into some of those here in a little bit and give you a little bit of a tour of the staff portal. Um, we've taken things like these pie charts and really kind of collated this data. So this is from the TAB level D. If you see down here, this is this is kind of where that data lives right here. This is the level D. So you'll see all of these pie charts, instead of just kind of breaking them out into one, they're all kind of collated into one uh, chart. And so that'll be a little bit easier to look at. And so like just from looking at this chart, we can see that things like uh, number and operations in base 10 really only exist on, you know, the level L, well, heavily on the level L, the level E, and then kind of dies down on the level M, not really on the level D or the level A. We see things like functions really only exist on the level D and the level A, heavily on the level A. Uh, we see, you know, geometry, the purple right there is, is, is across all five uh, different levels of the test. So there's uh, these comparisons on, on the staff portal um, for every single test. So we can really see what the content is that, are, that is actually on these tests. And so I want to switch over and I want to actually show you that. Give me a second to pull that up. Here we are. So here is the adult education staff portal. Um, again, my uh, URL up here is sites.google.com slash view slash AE staff. Um, you don't need this home right there. This will do you right there. That'll get you there. Um, but under this, you can see where here's where you can find some curriculum resources for your class. Uh, this is where all the state policies and guidelines will live, as well as some training resources, like all of the webinars that we'll be doing, including this one, will be uploaded here, uh, as well as some different professional development resources and things like that, that either we create or just kind of exist nationally as well. All of our contact information uh, is here. We You can find out some more things about adult education here, and any uh, forms or paperwork that you or your students might ever need uh, will be here as well, um, like the HSE recommendation form or anything like that that you might ever need. And we'll have some other features too, uh, like in the winter, where whenever we need to report a class closure, this will exist here as well, and that'll go out directly to all of the students. So that feature will be released here shortly as well, and that's that's exciting. Um, but I want to show you again, I want to show you this, these breakdowns of these TABE tests um, and talk a little bit more about these standards and the resources that you can find here on the on the portal as well. So all of the TABE information lives kind of here under ABE. The, all of these uh, curriculum resources are broken out into kind of five different categories, with ABE and HSE, uh, IELCE and ESL, 
distance education, we have digital literacy and workplace readiness. There's not a lot right there under digital literacy and workplace readiness right now, but we're going to be adding stuff uh, just as time goes by. Um, but again, all the tape stuff lives here because this is kind of where the tape is. Uh, so I'll click there, and this is kind of where we can explore all of the CCR standards. We can explore the curriculum maps that were created a couple uh, years ago by this office. Um, and then here's where we can kind of dive in and see all the stuff going on on the tape tests. Here's, here's what we were looking at earlier. Um, and then up here, this graph kind of breaks this out by um, all of the different strands or all of the different categories that are on the tape as well. And so we can see over here, these are the different levels of test. Um, one thing that we can see is that the, at least how TABE defines algebra only really exists on that level A test. Um, as well as functions really only exist on that level D and that level A test as well. Uh, we have uh, the number system is really only on the M and the, the D test as well. And so again, we can just kind of break all of that out in, in various ways and compare these tests. Here's the reading test right here. Uh, we can see, you know, phonological awareness or just kind of the sounds that letters make is really uh, only on that level L test. Again, that's just kind of more for, for new readers or, or folks who, you know, have never even really seen our alphabet before. Um, then we have phonics and word recognition, again, getting into the level E test, and then everything else is a, a little bit more, uh, you know, unique or not unique, but uh, across all different levels of test there as well. And then this is, again, broken out by tape level right here, down at the bottom. For the language test, which, again, probably won't see a ton of use, but this is a little easier to stomach. Uh, we have, you know, everything is, is pretty, uh, pretty much the same all the way across, where we have all five different subtests using each one of these different uh, categories or strands right here, except for knowledge of language, which is really only a little bit, what, 5% there on the M and 10% there on the level D. So all of this stuff, again, exists on the portal, and I would definitely encourage you to go check it out. If you, if you want to you know, kind of pop these out and look at these a little bit bigger, you can always do that as well. Um, you can save these things if you'd like uh, as well, and you know, just keep them on your computer, whatever you'd like to do there. Um, but I want to show you some more uh, stuff about the standards, how you can actually explore these. Um, we've created some really good tools here for you. So I'm going to click here on Explore the CCR Standards. Uh, where I can go and explore the math standards or I can explore the ELA standards. And so let's uh, start here with the ELA standards. So I'm going to click on this, and this is where I can actually explore what's what's really going on with all of the this uh, ELA standards. So this gives me uh, a bunch of different tabs right up here where all of these different CCR standards are uh, split out into different ways of categorizing and looking at them. So I'm going to click here and we'll start here. So we can explore these standards based on the level of TABE. So every uh, ELA, uh, so this is for the language and the reading level, we can look and see, let, let's click on the level E here. So this is every single CCR standard that's on the TABE level E reading and math test. So we can look and see, you know, all of this all the way from, you know, very beginning level, demonstrate command of the conventions of standard English grammar and usage when writing or speaking. Uh, all the way down to here, uh, which is some of the writing standards. And this kind of looks like a lot more than it is because you kind of see an A, B, C, and a D. So we have like 3.w.2a and .2b and 2c, so on and so forth. So here are every single one of those standards that's on the level E, TAB. And we could look at all of the M standards as well, or the D standards, or however we would like to look at that. Or we see like site-specific textual evidence that's very uh, popular in the standards right now. Um, we can explore these by tape category again. So if we want to look at things like, uh, let's say, key ideas and details, uh, here's, let's see, here's, here it is. Here's the one we were looking at earlier where it says, determine the main idea of a text, recount the key details, and explain how they support the main idea. That's what we were looking at earlier. So that's right here under key ideas and details. Uh, we could look and see what some of these phonological awareness standards are. Again, these are only on the uh, level L test, but here's what they are. There's only six of them, so that's a little easier to stomach than a giant list. Uh, if we wanted to look at uh, some of these conventions of standard English, uh, again, these are going to start all the way with your very early literacy stuff. 
uh, like print many uppercase and lowercase letters and go all the way through some of the more difficult uh, rigorous standards with, you know, use a colon to introduce a list or a quotation. Um, so we have these by tape level, by tape category. We could look by CCR strand as well. So this is where we see like reading for informational text or any of these standards. This is this is pretty easy to stomach. There's only what roughly 10, 11 of these standards, which are which are good. Again, these are the only ones that are on the tape uh, across all the different levels that are reading for informational text. We could see all of the standards for historical and social studies test. Uh, very easy to stomach right here. Only three. There are only six standards right there. Uh, reading for scientific and technical text. Again, this is a little bit easier as well. So if we want to teach some science uh, lessons, uh, this cut might be a really good place for us to start kind of understanding how we should go about teaching that. We could also look at these by NRS level. So we could look and see if a student is a level four student, these are kind of all of the things they should be able to really do before moving on to a level five. So we have all of that here. Uh, we have uh, by high set correlation as well, and this is something I know everybody's really interested in seeing, is all of these standards appear both on the TABE and the high set reading test. So these, this is where this kind of intersects. If this was a, uh, say, a Venn diagram, this would be the intersection right here between the TABE and the high set. And if we check this out, look at this, this is a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of these standards that are actually on both tests, which is great. Uh, that's one complaint I remember having myself as a teacher uh, back when we, you know, had the tape 9 and 10, and then we had the GED, and then we switched to the high set, and it was like, this is a completely different way to measure students. And so you had these tape skills that you would teach to try to get level gains, and then you had these high set skills or GED skills that you would teach to try to get diplomas, and, and the two just never really intersected. But here we can see there's actually a very large intersection of skills that are on both the table 11 and 12 and the high set. And so that's that's really good. Uh, that means that students uh, should have a very seamless uh, educational journey from taking the table all the way through, you know, passing the high set. And so that's, that's really important to know. So here's everything that's on the table uh, 11 and 12 high set and the high set reading. Here's everything that's on the table 11 and 12 language test and on the high set writing test. And so again, we see a large intersection of standards here, which a lot of this stuff is stuff that we've been teaching forever. I mean, use punctuation to separate items in a series. Uh, I've taught a lot of lessons on using commas to separate items in a series. A lot of this stuff is, is what we're teaching already. Subject verb agreement, uh, these kinds of things, capitalization, commas and quotation marks. This kind of stuff is on both the table 11 and 12 and on the high set writing test as well. And so that's a good thing to know. So if we want to look and see what are the, what are the standards that exist on the uh, high set, oh, only on the high set reading test and not on the tape test, these standards. These are the only standards that exist on the high set write reading test and not the tape test. And it's not a lot. Was that only seven standards right there? And this is fun. These standards only appear on the high set writing test and not the TABE language test. So there's two. There's only two standards that appear on the high set writing test, but not the TABE language test. So again, just kind of notes, you know, that this is this is something that's actually a really good thing for our programs is we're, we're going to see more of a, a seamless journey uh, of assessments for students. So we're not having to teach very different skills to students. And, and again, that's kind of the subtext of the standards. It really gives us that common language uh, to, to share. And, and I'm saying this as somebody who's not a huge fan of, of standards, but also I understand what they really give us. The, this is kind of the one thing that we really get from standards is a very seamless process. And so that, that's a very good thing for us. Now, one other thing that's really fun is we also have, if you just want to search for one particular standard, and here's our whole list, if you just want to search for one particular standard, uh, like let's search for main idea, uh, it only is going to pull up the standards with the main idea. So here's our standard from earlier. Determine the main idea of a text, recount key details, so on and so forth. We have something very similar underneath that. And so we can actually search for anything, uh, and it'll pull up as long as there's a match. It'll pull up any of those things as well. And so that's something that we can do uh, if we're looking for, okay, how am I going to teach main idea? 
oh, this is a really good lens for me to use to teach uh, determining the main idea. Okay, so that's all of our tab uh, ELA standards. Let's look at kind of the stuff that's on the math, and, and we have a very exact similar thing right here as well. Um, there's one more feature with this as well that I'm excited about that I'll show you too. Is So we have these organized uh, by tape level, by tape category. Uh, this is different. We have by high set category. So this is how the high set um, actually organizes their standards. And we have these organized, all of the tape standards organized by how the high set organizes that. Uh, we have NRS level and high set correlation here as well. And so let's just kind of look at some of this stuff and, and kind of dive through this as well. And, so if we wanted to see everything that is on the level D math test, I would click here as well. Um, and then we can go down and, and look at some of the, let's see, what was our, our standard from earlier? 8.sp.1, investigate patterns of association in bivariate data. Now here's one really cool thing, I think, about uh, this, is that this actually uh, is a link. And so if I click here, this will take me directly to Khan Academy. Uh, it'll take me directly to where I can practice that particular skill, that particular standard, on Khan Academy. So you see here it pulled 8.sp.1, and here I can look at positive and negative linear associations in scatter plots, and I can click on that, and that will take me directly to where I can actually practice some of this stuff on Khan Academy. So Let's scroll down here a little bit, and I can see here there's a positive linear relationship going on. So I'll click on that. I'll click on check. I got it right, and we could move forward from there. Uh, if I wanted to look and maybe just see a video first uh, instead of you know trying some practice, all of that stuff is over here on the left as well, just in typical Khan Academy fashion. So I could click on that and, and have Sal Khan explain how to do this stuff before I really dive into the practice as well. And so some of that is really good, not just for students, but uh, for us. When, when we get into some of these more level A, these really difficult things like functions or whatever that is, here's, here's something fun, analyze functions and using different representations. I can click on that and it'll take me to a place where I can actually listen to, you know, Sal Khan explain how to do this before I, you know, have to go in and teach a lesson, lesson about this. Uh, and if you notice, it takes you directly to where that is. Even if it's further down in the page, it, that link is going to take me directly to this standard. And so that's, that's, again, another really good thing to know right there. So I'll save you the trouble of having to look at functions right now, and we'll exit out of that. Uh, but this is something really great uh, that we've programmed into this uh, for, uh, for you to be able to find some good resources for yourself and for your students. And so we've got these separated by tape category as well, or by domain. And so if we wanted to look at, uh, you know, statistics and probability standards and uh, scroll down and find our friend with bivariate data, again, that's there. Um, every single one of the geometry standards, which again, that exists on every single level of the tape. So that may be something important to really talk about. All of that stuff is on here as well. Um, and it's all just a little bit easier to stomach this way. Uh, we can look at by NRS level and see here's all the standards that somebody at a level three really needs to know before they uh, dive into a level four content. That's all right there. Uh, and then here's, I think, everybody's favorite. Again, this is kind of by high set correlation. So all of these standards right here, which again are pretty significant, all of this exists on both the high set and the TAB 11 and 12. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, but that is, again, a very large intersection of skills. So I think that really gives us just one kind of comprehensive list of things to draw from to teach students. That way they'll be successful both on the TABE 11 and 12 and on the high set. If you want to look at who, uh, what standards are only on the high set and not on the TABE 11 and 12, that's where we can click here. And this is, list is a little bit larger, um, but it's really not that bad. This is, this is a little easier to stomach, I think, uh, than maybe that long list of 37 standards that was on that blueprint earlier. And again, we can also search for the CCR standards as well. So if we want to look bivariate data, here we are. Here's all the standards, all four of them, that deal with bivariate data and with scatter plots. They're all right there. So they're all, notice, about an eighth grade or a you know, high level four standard. That's what all these are. Okay, 
So I want to show you, this is, again, this is all here under the, the, uh, the staff portal under AB and HSE. This is where you can go to explore the standards. If you want to look at, let me get out of that. Uh, if you wanted to look at, uh, say, IELC and ESL resources as well, this is where you can find all of that stuff. You can register students to vote here. You can find the Citizenship Resource Center from uh, the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services. So if you have ESL students, here's a bunch of really good free learning resources for you as well. Uh, and again, this will get into distance education and workplace readiness. If you have any policy and guidelines that you'd like to look at, like some of the curriculum and instruction policy, all of that stuff is here as well. So that's a really good resource for you to look at any policies that have uh, come out. Okay, so that's the staff portal. Uh, I want to now, let's go back here and just pull that up. And now I want to switch gears and show you another resource, which is just the TABES website, which is very easy to find. Uh, here's the URL. It's tabetest.com. That's all you have to know tabetest.com that'll take you directly here and this is where you can find a lot of the resources uh, that I was showing you earlier so here under resources uh, if you go to 11 and 12 table 11 and 12 uh, this is where you can look at uh, all of the practice items so if I click here this will take me to where I can view all of the different practice items uh, this is the practice test that I was showing you earlier um, so it gives you the EMDNA sample items uh, for reading, language, and math. So if I wanted to pull up and see what you know a really difficult reading test would look like, I could pull that up and, and see, oh wow, this is a lot. <laughs> First off, there's four pretty lengthy passages right here. Uh, another fifth and a sixth, and then we're getting into some key ideas right here. That's, that's good to know. Uh, we're getting into some author's purpose. Again, that's also very good to know. Here's another two-parter, part uh, A and part B. Uh, number four is also a part A and a part B. Again, we're really looking for evidence here, so that's also very good for us to know and for students to know. If we wanted to look at you know, what a really difficult math test looks like, here we are. Uh, already we have some uh, multiplying of polynomials, I think, or uh, equivalent expressions. Yeah, that's, that's pretty hard. Um, We've got some more scatter plots right there, but this at factors in a line of best fit and uh, some y equals mx plus b stuff as well. Um, and then we get into some, you know, option A through F, and look at this. This says select the four that apply. So there are four answers to this. Uh, that's that's a little tough, but uh, again, I think as we're talking to students about this tape test, I think it's very important that we tell them to thoroughly read all the directions here because if I didn't see that I might come across the very first one that I think is equal to 5 squared uh, which I don't know exactly what that answer is offhand but I might just select that and then move on from there and so that's again something very important to know so again that's all the practice test items as well we can look and find uh, all of the blueprints that I was showing you as well are all here on the website so we can see all the level or all the language blueprints here up top. Uh, there's all the math blueprints here. So if we wanted to look and see what was going on with that math test that we were just looking at, uh, this is the level A math test, which gets you know 28% functions, and that's a little difficult. Uh, but again, we can look at all of those blueprints here, um, or again, we can look at a lot of this stuff organized on the staff portal as well. Uh, let's see, there's some more resources we can look at. Oh yeah, one other thing that I wanted to show you was this, this individual profile report. And I've actually got this pulled up down here. Uh, so I'll show you this. Um, this is a report that you will get uh, any time a student takes a tape test, whether they take uh, the tape, um, whether they take it on computer or paper and pencil. So long as their test wasn't hand scored, um, so if they use the bubble sheet, then they, you'll get this report. This is the individual profile, and I'll just kind of walk you through this really quickly. Uh, this is for, you know, Mike Johnson, and he took the reading test uh, level A here, so it's the hardest, you know, reading test. He attempted 40 questions, so that tells us there's 40 questions on that level A test. Uh, here, here's a scaled score and standard error of measurement, which are, don't really tell us much. This is good to know. He tested at a NRS level 5. Uh, we could look and see that his math, you know, he took the level M, attempted 35 questions here, 35, all of that, and uh, tested at a level 4. 
and then a level 5 here in the language as well. So we did pretty good, um, did pretty well. Uh, and this actually gives us a little bit more data here too. So just a couple things to note. Here's the, here's the reading test. Uh, we can look and see here are the different domains. So craft and structure. Uh, there were 17 questions about craft and structure, and he was partially proficient. So we've got non-proficiency, partially proficiency, uh, excuse me, partial proficiency, and, and proficiency here. And so he did pretty well. Again, I uh, tested partial proficiency and all the way up to proficiency for a lot of this. I imagine a lot of our students, especially once we get into, you know, algebraic thinking and expressions and equations, we might see some non-proficiency going on here. Um, but that's a really good way to use data, uh, assessment data, to inform our instruction. That's a really good way for us to look and see what's going on on these tests, how our students performed, and then inform our instruction that way. So we could see, you know, the student in geometry was partially proficient. And then if we wanted to, uh, we could drill that down even a little bit further. And this shows us all of the different skills that are in each of those domains. And so here's our, uh, what were we at? Craft and structure, I think. And then we said uh, all of the skills are right here. So I could say, okay, here's an interesting one. Identify how author uses rhetoric. That's a skill that I might want to teach. Uh, to Mike because he tested it partially proficient for that. If we wanted to look at math, we could see, okay, here's our geometry. Here's the two skills that were on that test, okay, under geometry at least. Here's one of them, no coordinate values and grid quadrants. So just be able to kind of identify where those coordinates exist on a grid. I think that's what that's telling us. And so that's some good information for us as instructors to be able to go and anybody else, support staff, to be able to talk to students about what kind of skills they need to be able to have in order to succeed on these tests and really succeed on the high set and then uh, future post-secondary or career opportunities because that's really what you know we're hoping to do. So uh, if we were going to use this uh, and we wanted to really understand you know what kind of standards and what kind of things we wanted to do with this, let's just look at identify how to how an author uses rhetoric. If I wanted to go and uh, pull up the staff portal here, uh, let's see, let's pull this up. Um, I could go over here to the ELA standards and what were we looking at? Rhetoric, uh, exploring rhetoric. So if once this loads here, I can search for rhetoric. And there we are. There's one standard, which is a 9 through 10 standard. So, you know, early high school kind of a level. It says, determine an author's point of view or purpose in a text and analyze how an author uses rhetoric to advance that point of view or purpose. So that's really what that uh, skill is talking about, is this standard right here. If we wanted to look at uh, maybe our geometry standard and maybe find some Khan Academy resources, again, we could pull up this and see, okay, geometry, no coordinate grid values and grid quadrants. Then maybe let's go search by tape category, geometry. Uh, we could we could look through this list of standards and maybe find something about coordinate plane, or we could maybe just search for coordinate grids, and here's all of our standard about coordinates. And maybe, okay, here's a good one. Graph points on the coordinate plane to solve real-world and mathematical problems. Okay, so graph points. So let's click on that, and that will take me directly to Khan Academy, again, where I can practice that particular standard. So this is a really good thing that I could assign to Mike. Uh, if he comes in and, you know, you're looking for individualized instruction or to kind of differentiate your instruction, or maybe you just want to kind of push this out to him uh, to do, you could send this out and here we are. This is where we can identify coordinates and really practice those skills that Mike is not proficient at. So this could be a really good resource for you um, to be able to kind of utilize this um, uh, report in tandem with you know what's going on on the on the staff portal over here as well and so yeah here we are what's the y coordinate of the plot pointed below okay well here's the x and here's the y so the answer must be four and we'll check that and i got it right and we can move on Okay, so this has been a fire hose of information. I, I understand that. Um, I want to just remind everybody again that if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type those into the chat box. You can send those to just me. Um, my name in the chat box, by the way, is you, you don't see Adam Soans. You'll see Christina Pleeman. 
Uh, she's our director of marketing and professional development, and this account is under her name. So if you have any questions that you want to send just directly over to me, uh, please feel free to do so and send that just directly to Christina Pleeman. You can send questions to everybody if you'd like to as well, but uh, if you'd like just for me to see it, then you can just direct that over to me. Um, so as you guys are, are really thinking about anything like that, let me just pull up this last uh, this presentation again here. And yeah, again, just let me know if you have any questions. Um, again, my, kind of my overall observation uh, of this test is that it's it's harder and it's longer. That's very true. Uh, but it's more aligned to the high set uh, and more aligned to a lot of the curriculum that's been developed for adult education and more aligned to what their experience might looks like, look like in you know a post-secondary environment. Uh, and that's really good for us to have as a way to really measure those skills uh, that might also be measured later in life. And that, that's good for our students to be able to kind of get a seamless educational experience. Uh, this gives us a really good indicator of success on a high set without having to really even dive into, you know, a lot of practice tests or something like that. If we see a student succeeding at high levels on the TABE, well, that student will probably succeed at high levels on the high set as well. And so that gives us a lot more information. Uh, so we don't have to over-test students all the time, constantly assess them, because we know that that's not a really great experience for students or, or for us as teachers. We want to we teach. We don't want to assess all the time. Um, and yeah, there's, there's really no more tape skills versus high set skills or CASA skills versus high set skills. So it really kind of gives us a unified system of, of standards uh, to talk about. So, but yeah, there's a lot going on, and I get that. There's a lot happening with this test, and it's it's a lot more difficult um, for uh, for our students. Uh, but again, it really gives us some more uh, detailed information, and and it really gives us a better opportunity to provide the correct instruction and make sure that we are on task and make sure that we're really sending them down a direction that's relevant uh, to their goals. And again, that's just kind of another pillar of adult education, right? is not only do adults need to know why they're doing something, but also they need to know, you know, that it's relevant to their overall goal. Um, and so this kind of gives us that relevancy as well. It gives us an opportunity to really rethink our intake and orientation process. There's there's nothing, there's no law out there that says that we have to give students a, a CASAS or a TAPE test the minute they walk in our door, uh, that we have to, you know, do a 30-minute overview and then immediately go into testing. We can... We can save that. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do any assessment, you know, 20 hours into the program because that's not really good for the students either. But we don't have to assess them the minute they come into the door. Or may, maybe we can divide out that assessment over a couple days or, you know, the first few times a student comes in, maybe, maybe they take an assessment uh, then, uh, but not everything right up front or something like that. So it really gives us that opportunity to, to rethink uh, a little bit about our programming, and that's good. So that is all I have for you all. Uh, I don't see a lot of questions or really any questions in the chat box right now. Um, I am going to, well, here, I'll do this. Let me do a couple things here. Uh, this is my contact information, uh, which actually I'll give you that here in just a second. I do want to give you uh, this as well, which is the, where are we at? Ah, here we are. The sign-in form. So if you need credit for this for professional development points or, or if you would like to you know, just get a certificate of attendance, I'm going to go ahead and copy this and I'm going to paste it in the chat box and I'm going to send this out to everybody. And what you can do is click on that uh, and then you can go in and, and fill out this form. So you'll put your email address. That's, oh, this is me. Don't, don't put my email address. Put your email address there. Uh, your first name your last name, and then for the session, uh, you will choose new tape content. So that's that's this session. We're not utilizing Jobs for TN. We're looking at tape stuff. So I will choose that, and then I will click Submit. And this will actually send me a, uh, directly send me an email where I can see, um, where I can see that uh, certification. So make sure you put in your email correctly. I'll, I'll show you what this looks like as well. Let me kind of drag this over. So this is the email that I'll get. As soon as I put in uh, that form, I will get this email, and it will give me this certification that I can then use for professional development or, or whatever it is that, that you need to use this for. So 
this is something, uh, again, is in your chat box right there. If you need, um, for some reason, you can't pull that from the chat box or, or anything like that. Or, or by the way, if you're watching this with several other folks and, and you need to submit more than one, you can always just submit another response and then you can keep submitting these uh, for everybody that's in the room with you right now. Okay, so I will put up again my contact information. Please, please feel free to contact me here. Um, I'm going to kind of hang out here online for another little bit. If anybody has any questions, uh, you are more than welcome to type those into the chat box. I will do my best to answer them. Uh, if not, uh, then I, again, I really appreciate everybody for being here, uh, for taking the time to, to listen to me drone on and on about the tape for a little while. I'm sure that's not what you'd love to be doing on a Thursday night, but, uh, that's, that's where we are. So I, I appreciate you. Um, I will, again, like I said, hang out here for another little bit. Have any questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Uh, I appreciate you all. I appreciate everything you do uh, day in and day out for your students. I know uh, you all are some of the hardest working people in, in the states. <laughs> some of the best educators that I know are in, in adult education. And so I am very appreciative of you. Um, everybody here at the state staff is all very appreciative of everything that you do. So Again, I'll be here for a little bit. Uh, if you don't have any questions, I again, I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Feel free to contact me if there's anything that I can do for you. Thanks, everybody.